Arirang Prime. He passed away in 2007. Russell Blaisdell. He was an American, but guarding his grave is a group of Korean children. Called the Oscar Schindler of the Korean War for his Operation Kitty Car, Russell Blaisdell saved a thousand Korean orphans. It's a caffeine addiction. She started drinking coffee when she was 10. Who is she? Nanun Chongjen Kwada. On June 25th, 1950, the North Korean forces, led by 90,000 soldiers and Soviet-made tanks, invaded the South. The North Koreans called their invasion Operation Pokpun, meaning storm. The Korean War had begun. Koreans refer to the Korean War as a tragedy of a fratricidal war. Innocent lives were brutally crushed because of differences in ideology. I was 
자식이 부모가 비명 소리 그 듣는 거 맞아갖고 비명 소리 듣는 거. 난 지금 이게 인각이 돼 있어요. 죽도록 맞아갖고 반한 도시에 이제 보내서 가라고 그래갖고. 그냥 기다 실패하고 왔는데 그날 밤에 죽어버렸어요. 맞아갖고 그냥 영마 살에서 그냥 너무 맞아. He became an orphan overnight. At the time, he was only nine. <laughs> Yu Ki Han became a war orphan at the age of eight. Both of his parents were killed because his older brother had collaborated with North Korean soldiers. <laughs> 어떤 사람이 이제 바스를 메고 있어, 저 손으로 바스를 갈고 있었어요. 저기 너무 저기 저기 저 붙이셨다 그래가지고 거기 가니까는 평평한데 거기서 이제 막 파니까는 머리 카락이 나오더라고. 계속 막 붙잡고 울었죠, 뭐. Buddhist monk Byung Jin also lost his parents during the war. His father was a prominent figure in the community. Which made him a target for North Korea. 고아가 된 거죠, 막 갑자기. 그때 제 나이가 네 살. At that age, he was too young to understand what was happening around him. 부모님 생각은 안 나셨어요? 모르죠. 부모라는 생, 개념이 없죠. 부모를 알면은 엄마 아빠를 찾는데 엄마 아빠가 기억이 있을 때서부터 아예 없으니까는 나만 그런 게 아니라 전부 다 그러니까. During the Korean War, about 100,000 children became orphans. The death toll rose as the war continued. More than 500,000 children were killed over three years. In Seoul alone, 4,000 orphan children roamed the war-torn streets. What plagued them the most was acute hunger. Winter arrived sooner than expected in 1950. Temperatures fell to below minus 30 degrees Celsius, becoming the biggest enemy to soldiers and civilians alike. Houses were destroyed by bombs. People foraged for cardboard boxes discarded by American GIs to build makeshift shelters. Orphaned children spent the winter living in the frozen streets. When the American troops arrived in Seoul, they drove through the streets, picking up children who were on the verge of freezing to death. The children had probably never seen Americans before, but they did not shy away from these foreigners who had handfuls of food to give out. Did you 
다이 분투력 맞네요. 이게 이제 실고 들어오는 모양인데 애들 이 서울 시내 종로 바닥 높은 종동 명동에 있는 애들 명막 주어 실고 지금 말하자면 종로 국민학교로 이제 막 데려간다. 이렇게 많이 실고 갔으니 말이죠. 에? 근데 얼어 죽을까 봐이 사람들이 우리 구한 거 아니냐고요. 전부 다 얼어 죽으니까는 이제 어? 전쟁 과들이 전부 다그 체험 없는 것들이 전부 다 그냥 서울 한국 전부 다 얼어 죽을 거 전부 다 말이죠. 어머 천여 명을 갖다가 그것도 천국적으로 구한 것도 아니고 명동, 봉정동, 종로 바닥에 있는 애들만 구한 게 그렇다고요. The children were taken to Jongno Elementary School in Seoul. Soon after the war broke out, the school was used as an orphanage. He remembers the school, but not the person who took him there. To the children, the American soldiers all look the same. They could not possibly know then that someone had directed the rescue. They would only find out many years later. Big Rock Garden in Bellingham, Washington. On Mother's Day, the local artists come together to hold a small event. This Korean-style pavilion was completed in 2003. This is where Dr. George Drake carries out his memorial project for the Korean War orphans. And we want this. Little boy, I took this picture in Korea. I want this to portray the impact of war on children. <laughs> I've seen it. Mm -hmm. I've seen the impact of war on children. 500,000 children died in three years of the Korean War. We can't forget that. The sculptures are reminders of the Korean War orphans. children who became orphans at a time when they needed their parents the most. Hunger and disease and artillery shells targeted at children, augmented with time. The estimate is upwards of around 500,000 children died. It's beyond one's ken. It's beyond one's imagination. It is. It is the greatest indictment of civilized nations, supposedly. It, it, it's a statement against war. During the Korean War, Dr. Drake was a communications scout for the U.S. Army. 
In the war-torn country, he personally witnessed what the children were going through. He sent thousands of letters back home to ask for donations for the orphaned children. After the Korean War ended, he traveled around America to listen to the stories of the U.S. soldiers who had helped Korean War orphans. He compiled 2,000 photos and 1,800 stories. The American troops established about 400 orphanages in Korea during the war. Many of the soldiers spent a portion of their wages to buy relief supplies. This was how they showed the children that they cared. The, the GIs needed the children to, to convince themselves that they're still decent human beings, that, that they're not just out there to kill. You know, it, you have to teach a soldier to kill somebody. It's, it doesn't come naturally. The children, too, followed the GIs around. They always got a handful of food whenever they asked. Dr. Drake was determined to tell the story of the friendship between American GIs and Korean War orphans to the world. It was through him that the story of Chaplain Colonel Russell Blaisdell first came to light. When he arrived in Seoul, there were, uh, it was estimated 4,000 children were living on the streets. And Blaisdell, as chaplain, could not accept that without doing something about it. He went out with a truck every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning with a nurse and a driver, and they would pick up children that were dying in the streets. He had people stationed different places to tell him where to find kids who were dying. Look under those sacks and you'd pick up all the sacks and underneath these, 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 these <coughs> pieces of cardboard and, and whatever is a little child. Damn, they're dead. He would take it out and almost frozen. Take it out, give it to the nurses, get it to the Seoul Receiving Center. The truck was heading to Jongno Elementary School. Chaplain Blaisdell and volunteers bathed the children in drum cans, gave them food and cared for them. Soon he found himself the parent of children who did not even know their names. Russell Blaisdell was born in 1910 in Minnesota. He majored in theology and at the age of 27 joined the U.S. Air Force and became a chaplain. Thirteen years later, he joined his troop in the Korean War. He was 40 at the time. Carter is the eldest son of Chaplain Blaisdell. This is my father's raincoat. It's more of a dress raincoat, and I've used it ever since he died. I was given it after he died. And this is a windbreaker. I never had a windbreaker, and about five, ten years, I don't know, before he died, 
He said, you need a windbreaker. I'd never owned one, so he gave me this green windbreaker. He was 16 when his father was stationed in Korea. Although he received letters regularly, he did not know the details of his father's work. I heard about the story first from friends at church who saw it in the newspapers and the magazines right after it occurred, right after December 20th, 1950. And they came to me and said, look, here's the story about your father's work with orphans. That's the first I'd heard about it. The articles he was shown recorded the event that had taken place on December 20th, 1950. What exactly happened in Seoul on that day? After winter arrived, there was an unexpected turn of events. The Chinese People's Voluntary Army entered the Korean War, overwhelming the UN forces. When the Chinese Communists entered the Korean War, it was really a dangerous time. I think anything that Chaplain Billingsdale did has to be put in that context. No one knew if the offensive from the Chinese would, would push us completely off the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very important that all military assets be used to stop the Chinese Communists. The sheer number of Chinese soldiers was staggering. It wasn't their firepower, but the size of their army that drove the UN forces back. Casualties started to mount among the UN coalition forces. They had arrived at the most critical juncture since the war began. Seoul, the capital of South Korea, was overrun by the Chinese. It was either flee or die. There was no other option. Like all others in Seoul, the orphans taking shelter at Jongno Elementary School had to leave to live. When going back to the city of Seoul, they had made no provision for the evacuation of those children that he had gathered up in what was called the Seoul Orphan Center in the school. He realized it was now going to be up to him to help get the children out. Just then, he received a parcel by mail. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for bringing this. It was a taped video of the late Chaplain Blaisdell. Thank you so much. Thank you. These are documentaries of my father's work since 2003 and filmed by Chris Zener from California who was, uh, for 40 years, did documentary work for the Air Force and tells the story from a human interest standpoint of different Air Force personnel. So he interviewed my father in Las Vegas for several hours. At last, the story of how one person orchestrated the evacuation of a thousand Korean orphans is revealed. I went to the United Nations and I didn't get any good response, but I did get word that the mayor and the president were well aware of the, ch of the children and they were going to furnish me a boat to be at Incheon Harbor. Their destination, Jeju Island. It was possible to ferry the children from Incheon to Jeju by boat. Jeju is the southernmost island in Korea. During the war, it was the only safe ground for the children. But just getting to Incheon Harbor was a challenge. It was difficult. We have one little flatbed truck. We have almost a thousand children, a hundred workers, and about 30,000 Pounds of provisions. 
they only had one truck at their disposal. Over three days, they transported all the children from Seoul to Incheon, traveling 34 miles each way. It took a phenomenal effort to evacuate all the children safely. And they, had, they felt it was their responsibility. And it wasn't a duty, it was just they felt a responsibility because they'd led the effort to gather them off the streets so they considered them their own children. It's been a long time since he was last here. A lot has changed. 63 years ago, a thousand orphans waited here for the boat that would ferry them to Jeju. That was on December 16, 1950, when the temperatures remained below minus 30 degrees Celsius. But the boat they waited for never came, and there were no promises that it would come. In the meantime, the children's health was deteriorating. And he goes to the port, there's no landing craft. And he's waiting another day, no landing craft. Children are dying. He's waiting for the landing craft. Children are dying. Without any heating, the children were fully exposed to the cold. Little could be done to stop the spread of measles and whooping cough. There was no medicine, let alone adequate drinkable water. And the Chinese army that had captured Seoul was getting close. They were running out of time. The situation got worse. Nearly all of the children caught measles or whooping cough. They did everything to curb the spread of the diseases. But seven children did not pull through. <laughs> On the third day in Incheon, the long-awaited boat finally arrived. And took one look and I said, this, this old scow wouldn't, I wouldn't put a kennel of dogs in here. And even if I could, the most I could get on there would be 40 or 50 kids. That's a drop in the bucket, it wouldn't do me any good. Fear struck him. Chaplain Blaisdell knew only too well what the Chinese army would do. So well, I can't figure it out. So the only thing was prayer. So that's what I prayed. And in essence, I told God, I can't do any more. If you want the kids to all die, then I'll, I'll understand. But I don't like it. Leaving the children behind in Incheon, Chaplain Blaisdell went to the U.S. Air Force office in Seoul. But the U.N. forces and U.S. soldiers had pulled out of Seoul already. One person, however, had not left Seoul yet. He was Colonel Turner Rogers, who had the authority to give commands to Air Force pilots. He says, I have a wing of C-54s, a National Guard wing. It just landed in a Shia Japan, and they don't have a mission. It was a miracle. 
However, Colonel Rogers promised to send 16 C-54 military transport planes to airlift the children. The entire history of the U.S. Air Force can be seen at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Also on display are military aircraft that were used during the Korean War. The situation in Seoul was critical. Even the UN forces were pulling out, yet Colonel Turner Rogers promised to send military planes for civilian use. We are in the middle of a crisis. The communists are moving down the peninsula. It's chaos. And these C-54s were very, very useful transports, uh, one of the larger size transports ports that the Air Force had at the time. And yet he was willing to allocate 16 of these just to get those orphans out. The Korean War had a significant meaning to the United States Air Force. It was the first war that the Air Force had joined as an individual branch of the military. The air supremacy of the Air Force was pivotal in many battles. And in this midst of war, Colonel Rogers had agreed to assign C-54s to a non-military mission. One would think in this military crisis that everything would go toward the military effort. It, it's even looking back all these years later and saying, wow, they, they allocated that much airlift for this, for a non-military effort, but I think some of that has to do with who uh, Colonel Turner Rogers was, his position, and the person that he was. It was a U.S. Air Force colonel who first proposed Jeju as a refuge for the children. Dean Hess, a U.S. Air Force colonel and fighter jet pilot, was stationed in Jeju at the time. Meanwhile, I had had this airfield available down in Jeju Island to train the Korean pilots. And it was very, I was familiar with it, uh, the airfield. And it's the only airfield I could see where we could go at the time. Colonel Dean Hess oversaw the preparation on the island. His task was to take the 1,000 orphans to a safe place once they landed on the island. The C-54s took off from Japan, and the orphans departed for Gimpo from Incheon. Colonel Rogers told the chaplain that the children had to reach the airstrip on time without any delays. He says, well, you'll have to have them over there because I can't land 16 C-54s at Gimpo Tarmac. They can't stay there. So you'll have to be ready to load. You still were running fighters out of there. After his meeting with Turner Rogers, Blaisdell left Seoul and arrived in Incheon at 5 p.m. the same day. Now he had to figure out how to take a thousand kids to Gimpo by 8 a.m. the next morning. But by coincidence, he came across U.S. Marine trucks unloading supplies. He asked the Marines to assist him with transporting the orphans. He says, I can't do that. And I said, that's not a request, that's an order. That's a direct order, driver. Under his command, the U.S. Marines halted their work and got the children into the trucks. But the commanding Marine colonel appeared. The mission came to a halt. And he said, who the hell stole my trucks? And he was ready to shoot. He was mad, <laughs> yeah, angry. Blaisdell explained his cause to the colonel. But I want to show you something. Come in here. He followed me in. I said, you see this? I have to have all of these people over at Kimpo by morning. And this colonel, Marine Colonel, pauses for the longest time. I don't know how long, but it was a long pause. 
And very soon he says, my men and my trucks are all yours. Hallelujah. That's how they got to Kimpo from Inchon. The U.S. Marines gave the chaplain 12 trucks, and the 1,000 orphans filed into them. Too much time had been lost already. They had to reach Gimpo by 8 a.m. sharp. Nobody was there at 8 o'clock. The first uh, truckload of children and equipment arrived at 10 o'clock. He was delayed and didn't get there till 10 o'clock. And he had feared that the transports would be gone because surely they wouldn't leave C-54 sitting there vulnerable to attack. Surely they wouldn't do that. The children arrived at the airstrip at 10 a.m., two hours late, but the C-54 aircraft were still on the runway. It was almost a suicidal act to keep a fleet of planes on the ground when the enemy was fast approaching. Only the children were unaware of the dangers they were in. Their eyes were fixated on the huge transport planes. The children had no idea where they were going. Even if they had been told, they wouldn't have known where Jeju was on the map. This is one of the planes that airlifted the war orphans to Jeju. Because it was a military cargo plane, there were no seats. The cold steel floor and the roar of the engines left the children numb and mute. From Seoul to Incheon to Gimpo, and finally to Jeju. It took an hour by plane to reach their final destination. They were going to live. What had begun as one man's effort saved the lives of a thousand children. <laughs> One week after the rescue operation, something unexpected happened to Blaisdell. He was court-martialed for his actions. Within a week, Blaisdell is charged by his superiors with misuse of Air Force equipment and is threatened with a courts martial. 
we're charging you, you're going to go to court for misuse of Air Force property. Why? <coughs> Responsibility for the care of the civilian population rested with the 8th Army, not the Air Force. He was charged with misuse of U.S. Air Force resources. And finally, Colonel Pugh, who's there to hear it out, said, well, Chaplain, if you had it all to do over again, what would you do? But he was defiant before the judges. He said, I would do the same thing. He said, in fact, if you believe that this is not appropriate for Air Force, for cha Air Force chaplains to save starving, dying children, then I'll resign my commission as a chaplain. I'll have nothing to do with that kind of chaplain service. And then he walks out on him. He's fed up. The rescue operation of the orphans became an issue in American society. The case was different from others in one fundamental way. What's different about this is it came from the bottom up. This was not a four-star general saying, we're going to do this, or the president, we're going to do this. This was a lieutenant colonel chaplain who made it happen uh, and got support along the way as he did it. So it was kind of from, from the bottom up rather than the top down. Following dinner this evening, we will learn more about a few of the outstanding accomplishments by the airmen who fought the air war in Korea for tonight is their night. The Central Florida chapter of the Air Force Association is honored to make Chaplain Colonel Russell Blaisdell, United States Air Force retired, an IRC Acre Fellow of the Aerospace Education Foundation for his outstanding efforts in saving the lives of over 1,000 Korean children. 50 years later, Chaplain Blaisdell's mission was extolled as Operation Kitty Car, a heroic chapter in the history of the United States Air Force. This was given by the, the uh, Korean Veterans Association for his work with uh, the Korean people during the Korean War. This orphanage was where the children lived during the Korean War. Chaplain Blaisdell returned to Korea in 2001. He was reunited with the orphans, who were now elderly people like him. <laughs> 18살이었지만 오늘날은 내가 60이 다 돼서 이렇게 여기에서 당신을 찾아뵌다는 것이 이거 얼마나 참 상상할 수 없는 일인지 우리가 생각할 수 없습니다. 우리의 생명의 아버지가 되는 분이 다 바로 당신이 되는 걸 우리는 기억합니다라고 얘기한 적이 있어요. They, they called me father and many of them called me father. 아버님이라고 그러셨어요. 그러면요. 당연한 거 아니에요? 하, 기가 막혀요, 진짜. 이, 이분 생각하면요. 나, 내 목숨을 만들어준 거나 마찬가지 아니에요. 네. A memorial event was held in Big Rock Garden and attended by Korean War veterans. It marked the 50th anniversary of the Korean War, and Chaplain Blaisdell made this speech there. And some of us have times that we have an opportunity to make a decision of some moment. That was what happened in Korea. There was a decision made, and the little orphans resulted 
in a life that they at least could live. And so I ask you all, as you go through life, make sure you make the right choices. Thank you. After three years of war, a ceasefire was declared. Chaplain Blaisdell lamented that the war never ended. It would probably take one of these raw pieces. <laughs> Here's a corn and eat it right off. <laughs> raw. raw. <laughs> he wrote a memoir of his war experiences and sent the manuscript to an orphanage in Korea. Giving the orphanage the publication rights, Blaisdell also donated the money to cover the printing costs. Mm. Until the day he died, Chaplain Blaisdell showed a deep love for Korea. In May 2007, Chaplain Colonel Blaisdell passed away at the age of 97. Paying him respect are the thousand children he saved. These young children are now grown-ups who still speak of Chaplain Blaisdell as their father. Yu Ki Hun, who was orphaned at the age of eight, now runs a mill. Buddhist monk Byung Jin is a renowned painter of Buddhist themed art. Today, Kim Shin In is the loving father of three children. And Im Gyung A says that she owes her life to her father, Blaisdell. Chaplain Blaisdell saved a thousand young lives, yet oftentimes he was afflicted with a thought, a question that he could neither answer nor erase. One of the heartaches of my father was that he knew that by the city's estimates, the city of Seoul estimated there were 4,000 orphans. So he often wondered what happened to the other 3,000.